So whenever Thomas and I arrive here uh, at Tech Days, we, uh, we enjoy reading the, uh, the movie quotes outside. Uh, and the most famous one of, is, of course, I'll be back. But we read with that we are back, all of us. <laughs> and the, the other one is Make My Day by Clint Eastwood. Uh, but you already made our day because we have 800 people here. Um, sharing where we are going to share with you the, uh, the latest bits of, of NAV. Um, but also, I think it's an incredible effort that Luke managed to gather as much people, as many people here every year, and the venue keeps growing and growing. So first of all, let's give uh, Luke a great applause to uh, make sure he does this again. Um, those of you who have been here before knows that we uh, usually have this long agenda uh, and will not make through half of it. So this year we are going to cheat a bit and uh, throw up the topics that we are going to look at. So we are going to look at seaside improvements as always, the new reporting story, uh, something about the client architecture. We will start, of course, uh, a new big thing about upgrade on the system and also the, uh, the roadmap for moving forward. And then... Um, as usual, we are going to show you some stuff that might make it into the product and might not, but it's, it's surely interesting. Uh, we're going to share this. It's uh, in sort of whiteboard form right now, but it's, uh, it's a big thing that uh, we want to explore. Okay, so let's go right through it. Um, so let's go into Seaside. Uh, so during the uh, NAV 2015 release, uh, we, we basically took the whole team uh, out for two months to do test automation of the local versions. Because as you know, we now have these cumulative updates every month. And in order to accomplish uh, test automation, that we put the whole team on writing CL tests for two months. Uh, and by doing that, we found some areas from improvement in, uh, in Seaside, because uh, there's some cumbersome things that you all know uh, exist in Seaside right now, and basically been there for, for 20 years since we wrote it back in, uh, in uh, 1994. Uh, but let's look at some of them. Um, so it's not random I selected this report, and I'll show you why. Um, the deal is that uh, in... Uh, in Seaside, it's very cumbersome if, if you have a, a, a page and a sub-page and, uh, and you are on the sub-page and you want to uh, uh, update the main page. It's very cumbersome to figure out uh, how to do that without uh, having sort of an endless loop or not updating the, uh, the main page. So what we did was to... introduce a new property called update propagation down here. Um, and this, uh, you can update the sub parts as usual, but you can also uh, go to the parent and update it as well. And uh, the reason why I'm showing you, especially this form, uh, this page is that uh, this feature came in relatively late in 2015, so we only made it to put it into this one. But it's uh, up, up to you to use it all over the place. Another thing you can see in here is that uh, uh, all the uh, properties that changed in here, they are bolded, and the ones are not are not bolded, of course, uh, which makes it easier to overview what's changed and what's not changed in here. Um, another thing that you, you need all the time is uh, if you select something, of course, five years ago, we made the indentation where you press tab and then, of course, back. That works, uh, but what if you want to comment something? Uh, then you just press Control Shift K and uh, O to get it back. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not done yet. <laughs> um, so let's go to uh, the global menu in here. So. Um, Let's do something in here. So uh, you can see I put the name to the right instead of having it in front. So the deal is if, if I 
use record in here, and I want customer. Oops. Um, it's quite cumbersome to have to repeat the name again, so it autofills the uh, the name of the, the uh, of the record to be the same as the table name uh, as default. Of course, if you need customer two, you go in and edit that, but uh, that also saves a lot of time, especially if you have some of these uh, German table names with all the uh, uh, periods and, and what have you in it. Uh, so this also is a productivity gain uh, that's that's in there. Um, also, if you go in and add a new function, uh, we now have local as yes, because in the old days, uh, local was no, and you had all this function that uh, didn't make any sense to see in the uh, simple menu. Uh, that's all now, now hidden, uh, because uh, every time you create a new one, you forget to set this flag to, to yes, and then it's all over the place. Uh, so again, it makes the system more visible. Uh, to, to work in. Um, so yes, we uh, we spent two months in, in Seaside, all of us. Uh, yes? Yeah. <laughs> I still want to update to Notepad on the editor. Yeah, we'll get there, Thomas. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, but that's not all, so let's move back to the slides. So. Um, so beyond that, we, we actually started using uh, XML port internally uh, for real production code. And some annoying thing is that you uh, sometimes need the con path in there, and of course you can create that yourself using uh, AL, but, but now there's a function to, to get that uh, at, at your hands to, uh, uh, to write your code. Another thing is that uh, we, uh, when we did this Dynamics Online uh, uh, payment services, we made an encryption library in, in there, uh, and we also uh, saved the password in database. Uh, and that's really not handy, because if you take a back off of your database, then you also take a back off of the password, and uh, it's somewhere that you cannot control. I think we put it on automatic shift, but <laughs> um, and since we did the AMC integration, AMC integration for <laughs> can you fix this, uh, Thomas? While I, I speak, so <laughs> I told you you uh, you ruined my flags when we started. So <laughs> you do this every year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Any, not, uh, anything else you want me to fix? <laughs> We'll, we'll get to that, so uh, <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> uh, so instead of, of doing the same mistake over again and, uh, and creating a new uh, way of doing that uh, in, in the app, we created an encryption library. Uh, and basically, there's a set of functions where you can create an encryption key, and that basically creates a key and put that in, uh, in a folder on your server. Of course, you can delete it again, uh, and also you want to be able to export it because you want to have a backup if uh, something happens to the server uh, and you want to import it again. Uh, then when you want to use it, you use the encryption able to uh, enable it, and uh, then you can also ask if the key exists. Uh, and that's very useful if, if you run multi-tenancy. Uh, so the deal is that you basically have to run this on every server right now in 2015. We're trying to fix that in a future version, but right now you have to run it on every server. There's some control mechanism in there. If you, uh, by mistake, create different keys on two different servers, you, uh, of course, you cannot use encryption. Uh, it, will, uh, it will block you. And if you just have uh, encryption key on one server and not the other, it will also block you from using it. Um, but this is to get you going. And then, of course, uh, the caveat is that you can now go in and use the encrypt and decrypt functions to uh, do what you want to do. Uh, but go into the uh, simple menu and play with these. Uh, there's also quite some good documentation of this. Uh, and this is going to build out, be built out in future versions. <laughs> oh, you're, you're on yours, so. <laughs> no, no. All right. 
So what do we do now? So, so I want to talk about something else on Seaside. Just I want a to second, talk Thomas. <laughs> Oh, there we are. Huh? Sorry, this. I still it, want to talk about was, it, but that's fine. It I'll was wait. my mistake this time, so <laughs> <laughs> you can put that in your book. No, turn it back. It's not only me. Can we please lock this? Yes. Okay, um, we also have something upcoming, and if possible, we'll backport it into the CU that's coming out. So, uh, one thing that's needed to, uh, again, work, work real life with the XML port is you need namespaces. And then for those of you who work with the uh, Enables collections in, from .NET, it's really, really cumbersome to uh, do something comparable to for each. So actually, we put that into the language, and uh, there's a freeze and a break. But the uh, thing that is a break uh, keyword in there uh, prevents us from backporting it because it's a breaking change. But we'll see if we can work around that because that's really useful. <laughs> Uh, you also have runtime uh, access to metadata lookup, uh, URL generation, and uh, there'll be an upgrade tool for manipulating uh, pertinent report layout. Uh, then uh, um, a long list changes that uh, will have SQL timestamp support for <laughs> on records. Uh, so you can actually see when, if you do synchronization or something of that kind, <laughs> where did I get to the last time? And uh, also, the, you can do a lot of uh, really <laughs> nice things with this that you couldn't do before. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I want to talk about something else on Seaside. Um, our clients, you probably noticed that in 2015, we released a, a, a tablet client, which is, uh, you know, whenever I see that in action, I get thrilled. Whenever I see the web client in action, I get thrilled. These two things in combined, you know, show how we modernize our, our clients, how we, uh, you know, utilize the, the architecture behind that and how it was built. Many years ago, we prepared for this, and finally we are getting here, and it's just so, so big a thing, you know, to see all this. And what I want to show you today, I want to, you know, go a little bit behind the, the scenes and see, show you some of the things that, that goes on there. I'm not going to demo the tablet client. You've probably seen that, you know, uh, uh, a thousand times. Um, so let's just step into this. And then the question here is, you know, how do we build these clients? Because we are, we are asked constantly, you know, isn't that a big maintenance task to have these, all these clients, you know, and, and maintenance and so forth. And, and the real reason is we, we basically cheated because we did not build so many different clients here. We only built basically one. Um, and they share a lot of things. And even though, as you can see in the bottom of the screen here, they, they look very differently, what goes on inside the, the server, what goes on on the logical client layer, and what goes on in, in the JavaScript and so forth is more or less the same. That's very, very few uh, differences here. And, you know, the, the three tablet clients, and I call it the three tablet clients because it appears to be three tablet clients, are basically only one. We use a framework, an open source framework called Cordova, and these guys have built a native app which runs on iOS, runs on Windows, runs on Windows, you know, uh, on Android. And inside that, they host a web control, and inside the web control, there's some APIs, and eventually end up being HTML5 and JavaScript. So what we built is only only because it's quite difficult, actually. Uh, HTML5 JavaScript client that then can run inside these shims, which are three different shims, but they are built by, by the Cordova framework. So we end up having basically a, a single client running across uh, three platforms, which is pretty cool. And then the, the inner working of that is then mixed in with the web client. So we only, again, only because it is really difficult, you know, have to do one essentially when, when we are at the, at the bottom of this. So let's, let's go see this. So the first one I'm going to open up is the, the Windows uh, version of the, the NAV client. So this one, again, this is the shim we are seeing here, the Cordova app, and they are hosting a web control. And inside that web control, you'll see our HTML5 and, and JavaScript app running. So far, we're seeing a logo, but we should see it running at some point. 
There we go. So this is the, the tablet client. It's running on my, my Windows PC here, but it's basically the same thing uh, that we're seeing. I love the way that when you go into to, uh, screens, let's take the, the say it's all a quote, whatever, when you navigate here the animations between the screens and so forth, the use that you can use here, they also, of course, support touch, which is one of the, the biggest things for the, for the uh, uh, tablet and so forth. Everything you see here is basically the same thing as our web client. It's just, you know, uh, presented differently using the CSS and cascaded style sheets and so forth. Okay, so having seen that one, let's close out this one. Um, and let's do the, the web client. And if we just watch it, the oh, if we just watch it, the web client here. Um, so what we see here is something that looks again looks very differently, but the controls are the same, the metadata is the same, the application running behind it is the same, and so forth. We have a ribbon up here. Um, which is navigation model is different and so forth, but behind the scenes is the same thing. And one of the cool thing here is just to show you this, this is a browser, but the shimmed app we saw before is also a browser inside the shim. You can actually go change here the URL and just add, actually I want the tablet um, .aspx. And if I do that inside my browser, I now get the tablet app just to show you that this is actually a, a HTML5 a browser app that we are, we are watching here. So this is not, I'm not even using the shim now, I'm just navigating directly into the um, window that, that can host the, the tablet app. All right, uh, let's look a little bit about what, what goes on inside um, the client here. So the tablet client actually are different from the web client in, in certain areas. And the, the, the biggest one here is the navigation model between uh, the pages. We, we changed that in the 2015 release when we did the, the, the tablet app, so we stay within the same page. We would love to do that with the uh, web client as well, and there are several good reasons to do that, and that is that all the context you load up into the page, when you kind of go from the, the role center to the sales orders and so forth, all the JavaScript standard libraries, all the things we have in play here, when you change the URL of a page and navigate to a different page, all context is lost completely. So you have to reload everything from the server, and that takes time and so mm -hmm. forth. So we want to get away from that, and therefore we will, in, in the next release, probably change the web client to navigate and use the same single page um, application. So we are faking it by changing the entire contents on the page, but staying on the same uh, URL here. It also allows us to do nice animations and, and, and other things. Now, another thing that we did was we greatly reduced the HTML structure uh, when doing the, the tablet client. Uh, it's been an enormous effort done by our client team in, in making this uh, reduced. And the reason for that is, of course, that then we, the amount of data needs to be loaded from the server into the client is less, performance goes up, and all the goodness about having things being simplified. And what I want to show you here is just the, the number of levels and complexity of showing this uh, tile here. This is how it was before. And if you see at the bottom of this long list, there you actually have the number of, of sales orders text, uh, and you have all these layers in between. And, and that has been optimized to, to less than half. There are very good reasons for these being structured that, that they are. It's not like we could remove all of them, but getting to less than half is a fabulous thing, and we can see it in our performance measurements. We can see it in the UI responsiveness that the tablet client is, is way more responsive than, than the previous client, and we'll keep working on, on getting there. Another thing that we've done is we organized the cascading style sheets, which is you know, and a very important feature of doing these clients. This is where all the, the magic happens, which is that is what differs the, the tablet client from the web client, essentially. This cascading style sheet that define how things are looking. So basically data and, and controls and all that kind of are the same, but how they are looking is, is different here. 
And we started out with a, with a strategy aligning our CSS to, to SharePoint, which forced us into working with these in a manner that kind of didn't suit NAV that well. So what we're doing now is we're moving away from that and then going into uh, our, let's call it our own way of doing it, which, which uh, is more modelized and, and actually we are, we are saving a lot of repetitions and, and so forth. It's, it's again to improve the, the performance and so forth. That's a little bit about what happens in the, in the client. We have lots of things to cover here. Uh, Michael is now going to talk about some document reporting, and uh, I'll be back in a second. Okay, and I turned off the uh, use timing that you put in my presentation, Tom. Oh, Sorry. did I screw up your presentation <laughs> yeah. again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, now we're talking about re reporting, so I saw uh, Klaus Donstam just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so this is about document report, or uh, to stay in the movie terminology, uh, the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and uh, it's up to you to uh, figure out which is which. Um, so if, if you just install uh, 2015 Plano Adela uh, and start look for uh, word reporting, you have to look uh, very long to, to find it. Um, and you actually have to go into uh, to Seaside and uh, and find these four reports. Say, so what the hell is this? Just it? So uh, all this marketing fluff about word reporting, and it's not even there. And these uh, four silly reports uh, are the only things that's actually in there. Uh, but basically, there's a bit more. <laughs> um, so underneath, there's the uh, all the railroad tracks to to create the uh, the word reporting. Uh, and compared to the old days where we basically sandbox every, everything into Seaside and you could not change it, everything is opened uh, because it's an application just like, uh, like GL and NAV and you can modify the, uh, uh, the experience also what it does, uh, pretty extensive. Um, but what it does is to, uh, the big thing is that end users can now do uh, customization of reports, uh, which they of course could with the RDL, but it was a bit, bit more difficult. Um, also, we provided some new document reports, and you can say, oh, there's only four, but what we also did behind the scenes is to, uh, to clean up the reports, uh, and uh, in the old days, we had 20 ver versions of the RDC reports. If you look at the word reports and also the new RDL equivalents, there's only three different versions, uh, and there's the US version, that's because of sales tax, and there's the Spanish version, because they have two types of, two types of text that need, they need, and then the rest. Uh, so if you work across uh, multiple countries, it's much easier for you to go in and modify them. We also added scheduling and uh, did a lot of cleanup of data sets, not only in these four guys, but also uh, in other places and a lot of other new functionality. Um, you all know this, uh, especially listening to Klaus, uh, who's now with us again. Um, so with RDC reports, of course, the, the biggest thing is that it's, it's very costly to do this compared to the old reports. Uh, of course, if you're Klaus, you can do it really fast, but most people find it a bit more clunky. Also, it's, uh, it's a precision layout, and it's very difficult to do font changes because you, uh, you basically have to go and modify every uh, field in there. And also, it's, uh, it can be re really uh, complex to uh, to imagine what comes out of reports if you have something really complex. Um, also, you need to uh, uh, to be skilled to use this, and it's not exactly WYSIWYG, and uh, it's really not suited for end-user customization. Uh, but also, uh, there's some limitation of web reporting, so you're not getting uh, the, the magic silver bullet here, but uh, a combination. So basically what Word is, is that it's a notepad with some extra formatting, uh, and then there's uh, basically three controls that you can use. Uh, so there's a text text control, and a picture control, and there's a repeater. That's all you have. Uh, there's no grouping of totals, no conditionals, no, vis uh, no nothing to uh, control visibility. <laughs> Uh, and number forwarding, is, number forwarding is because it's only text fields, we are doing that in, uh, in the server. <laughs> Uh, so you cannot control that in Word. Um, but that said, we uh, really designed it to be simple. So, uh, so 
deliberately we didn't want to get parity between Word and RDLC. So RDLC is for when you want to create something complex, whereas the, if you want to create a simple uh, document layout, you, you probably would want to use, uh, to use Word. Uh, and also, uh, to, to make up for the uh, missing grouping and total capabilities in, uh, in Word, you can do that in dataset instead, and I'm going to, I'm going to use you, uh, show you how to do this. So. Um, and also, uh, uh, you would expect Microsoft to basically be able to uh, to convert a Word document to PDF, uh, but we have no such technology currently in, in Microsoft, so somebody is apparently working on it to ship in five years from now, so we had to go out and buy a component. Uh, but you know, Word is very complex, and a lot of things can happen in the rendering of, of Word, and between versions, they render different. And PDF is the same, so this is sort of uh, translating uh, Swahili to uh, <laughs> to French uh, in all dialogues at the same time. So something will not simply look the same if you uh, try to enter it. But that said, it's it's pretty damn close what you get out of it. Um, but what about RLC? Are we going to discontinue this? Of course not at all, because uh, it's still a good foundation for uh, report design and still our strategy. Uh, we have improved a lot of the RDC reports in 2015, and it can do a lot of things that Word is not good for. Uh, and we also shipped the uh, versions of the uh, document reports in RDLC to showcase what you can do uh, if you have the right, right data set underneath. Uh, also, Multisense gives a, a new challenge for this because uh, if you have a lot of tins, they, they might want to have different layouts. Uh, so we also enable this for RDLC reports as well as uh, Word reports. Uh, and uh, so again, this is optional to use Word or, uh, or RDLC, but if you have a lot of small tenants, uh, sm small customers running uh, in a V as a tenant, you might want to go for the Word options to, uh, to make sure that they can do customization of themselves. Otherwise, it will be too expensive for them to to pay, pay for, so. Uh, also, I said the, uh, the sort of the plumbing for our railroad tracks for word reporting is, uh, is open for you to go and modify. Uh, so one example is that uh, when uh, you want to run report, uh, it calls a function called, has custom laid out in uh, code unit one. Uh, and if, if you get word out of that, you basically, when you, uh, want to print out the document calls the merge document, uh, and and that, that you have to cover everything. You have to uh, to merge the uh, uh, XML data you get out uh, from dataset with the uh, word layout and and print it. It has to be done all of it. But the benefit, of course, is that uh, you can go in and replace this, and you don't even have to use Word. You can render to whatever you want, or call a web service, or uh, <laughs> go down to the basement and find your word layout down there, do whatever you want to do in there. It's all up to you. Uh, same thing with the custom layout if it's RLC. Uh, so basically this is loaded before the report is run uh, and there's nothing you can do to control that afterwards, but, uh, but still you can uh, again get the RLC for, from somewhere else and uh, not just necessary in the uh, NAV database. Uh, and just a little bit of drill down into uh, what happens with the word report design runtime. So basically from the data set designer, uh, uh, you get an XML description. And with that, you can go in and uh, create a new word document uh, with NAV fields or edit an existing one. And then at runtime, it, it basically uses this uh, using the XML merger uh, to create the document. So it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, and uh, once you get a hand of it, it's, uh, it's very easy to create these documents, <laughs> also compared to uh, RDLC. <laughs> okay, so um, let's go in here. So, um, so uh, now I'm going to show you a, a known crash. So uh, you just have to... Uh, <laughs> so. Okay.
Okay, so uh, our, our DPM, Marco, he says and, uh, when, when you are a male and, and you're over 50, you start making these sounds when you sit down. So I thought just it was part of being past 50. Is that correct? No, I'm, <laughs> so I'm, I'm I was thinking about how it was my fault that your mic screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll think more about it. Okay, please do, Thomas. So. Okay, um, so let's look into report selection. Um, so, uh, so by default, we haven't set up the uh, the system to use the new re word reports, and uh, uh, the reason for that is that we want to provide seamless upgrades uh, to from any of the newer versions into 2015 and also moving forward. So, if if we just uh, landed the new uh, reports on top of the Cosmos Cosmize RDLC reports, uh, they would probably not be that happy. So we, we decided to keep it uh, it's, it's separate. Um, so I'll just go to one of these. Uh, ah. Wrong. Can I get a spell checker next time, Thomas? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so in here you can see I have the old report uh, 206 and the new report is called 1306 uh, and that's basically all I have to do to, to run the new report um, but let's go a bit deeper so into the uh, report layout selection which is brand new uh, so I have to filter up here to get this one. So get the invoice down here and uh, I can all go, go in and see my custom layout. So, so that's of course nothing here because it's brand new. So I'll select a new one uh, and here I can select if I want to have uh, a weight lay word layout uh, to modify or the RDLC. So, so I'll select this one. Um, and now I can go and edit the uh, layout in Word. Okay, so I want to just get rid of this guy. Uh, let's go and uh, find something useful out there. So, uh, so we have tick days. Oh, how can that? Oh, it says that there's some copyright thing here. So, uh, so Luke, are you going to? Uh, Call for your lawyer, or am I going to do this? Oh, I'll, I'll do it anyway. So, so let's get this logo in here. Um, also, I want. So I'm probably from Bavaria or something. So I, I want a nicer font in here. So. <laughs> um, also, if, uh, if you go to the develop tab, uh, of, or if you haven't installed that yet, you, you go to the uh, options down here uh, and customize ribbons, and then you can go in and enable it here. Uh, but once you have it, you can go into the developer and look at the XML mapping pane. And you go down and choose the uh, Microsoft Dynamics in here. And under here, you can see all the fields you can use. Uh, and since, again, the, uh, there's no total concept in Word. Uh, we basically created all that in the data set. So if you go down uh, here, you have the uh, total lines and the totals, and you can use that as you wish in the report. So, um, so this is a point where I will try to unhook the network because now it will probably crash. We'll move on to Thomas. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, Michael, I find you a bit scared. Yeah, no. Okay. I'm amazed, so. Oh, great, so nice looking. <laughs> so now you know the workaround is that you just uh, unhook the network and then <laughs> Continue. Uh, 
we'll look into this when we get back home. Uh, right, Tom? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so once we are, we're done here, uh, we can go back and uh, now I tested this uh, and I can go and say, I want to have the customer layout. I can choose the one I just created and now you're ready to go and your users will be able to use this. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's up to you to uh, ex extend this as much as you like and uh, use in all different flavors that uh, suitable for, for your use. And uh, so just go ahead. Okay. Back to you, Thomas. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm scared about this guy sometimes, really. You know, it worked, huh? <laughs> amazing, amazing, you know. <laughs> All right, well. It, it wasn't even your code, Thomas. <laughs> no, 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 well, it's, it's, uh, no. The, the other thing, you know, what Michael was saying before with the, the, the thing that Marco said, that, that he said it to me at, at, at lunch. And what he said was the following. Do you know when you're getting old? And I kind of know because I don't feel I'm getting old at all. And said, that is kind of when you sit down and you go, ah. And then I start noticing I do that all the time. It's freaking <laughs> annoying, right? And, and try to figure that out yourself. Then you know when you're getting old because you probably yeah, we, are doing we, it. We had dinner with Jörg Bott yesterday and he was, ah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I think, I don't know whether you're getting even older if you do it when you get up, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about, you know, it's called rapid start upgrade here, but what really I think is the most interesting thing about the move that we are doing uh, within the, the, the product and in, in, in Microsoft in general, moving to the cloud, moving to volume, is all about automation. How do we automate, or automate things? So whenever you have something that needs to be done a thousand times in the cloud, either because you have multiple tenants or you have multiple repeatable installations of the same thing or whatever, how do you automate it? Earlier times, you know, demanded you to go do it one at a time, and, and we really need to get away from that and, and start automating way more. And this is what, what this is going to be about. So first of all, you know, why do we do the rapid start upgrade? This is going to be about rapid start upgrade code. I'm going to cover the data in a, in a second. Um, and first of all, because we are going to change the release cadence, we already did that. You probably noticed that we are releasing every a year uh, and you made your release but what will happen over time as we start you know moving into the cloud you'll see things like you know Office 365 being continuously updated and so forth and I'm pretty sure that with, with NAV we'll get there at some point as well where you don't have these major releases but you'll have you know incremental upgrades we are doing that with the cumulative updates and so forth and doing that, you need to be able to automate the entire upgrade process. Otherwise, it would be too expensive to, to uptake these. And that's this, what, it's, what it's all about. It's about being able to uptake the updates without much hassle. Now, unfortunately, there, there are something which is, which is blocking this for, for us. First of all, we do not have many automation tools at, at, at all. Um, and when we are using source code modifications, which really is a super benefit, quickly you get to the goal. On the other hand, you pay the price when you get to the upgrade. We all felt that pain uh, and, and so forth. So we also need to, to, to work on that. But merges when you're doing source code modification is just a pain. And, and, and we are working on that. And I know other partners and Peer and his, his merge tools are also working on the same thing. And, and it, it, it is possible to do something about it. Uh, and, and we are definitely going to join that, that game. So there's another reason. This is the most important one, right? We feel the pain ourselves. Because even though you might think that it's easy for Microsoft, we do not have these upgrade thing. And, and maybe you see the picture as, as this. We have a release. This is just a NAV 2013 R2. We have a release. We RTM it. We get some hotfix requests. We find bugs ourselves. We do some servicing. We end up doing a cumulative update. We release that, and we do the next one, and so forth. It's very easy for us because we do not have any upgrades whatsoever, do we? And the picture is, yes, we do, because 
Inside Microsoft, we have the trouble of having a W1 version, and then we have all the country versions where we do the localization. And all the country versions is not that different from any you know, vertical solution or any horizontal solution being added on top of the, of the product itself. So whenever we do something, we find an error in the Polish version. Now we need to fix it there, or we need to backport it into W1. We need to move it. Do we also need to backport it into earlier versions of the product, and so forth. Same thing with regulatory features that I implemented in a given country release. Where do we put it? W1 in the country release, move back and forth, and so forth. We have all these troubles ourselves. And the picture, of course, get even worse if we add in you guys, because now we just have the, you know, more dimensions on, on, on this, um, this full picture here. And it's not that easy to take all these uh, cumulative updates. So what we need to do is we need to focus on trying to solve what I call the, the square problem here. If we can move within one square and, and fix having two dimensions, Microsoft doing a vertical uh, or horizontal chains, partners do a, a, a vertical chains and then get to, to, the, to the corner piece automatically, then we can just repeat that pattern over and over again. And this is what we are, we are trying to address here. So let's, let's look at an example here. Assume we have a table. I'm doing it very simple because then I can understand it. That's the main reason here. Um, we have a table here, 888, and it contains a, a phone number and, and two uh, name fields. And let's assume that we, Microsoft, decide in, in some cumulative update or the next release to remove the first and last name field and merge them into a name field. That's a very simple change, but it's a simple example here. At the same time, however, a partner solution decided to add an email field to, to the same table. And if you try to do a three-way merge on this, you'll, you'll end up with a conflict because the position of the email field is unknown and you see changes in the textual format of, of, of the files here being in the same place and so forth. Uh, there are tools addressing this, but the tools need to address knowing the model, knowing to know about fields and, and, and so forth, not just the text file of, of the exported application object. So what do you do? Um, we need to operate with, with deltas. Instead of looking at text file and comparing text file to text file, what we need to do is we need to figure out what is the difference really here. And what we do then is we look at either direction. It doesn't matter whether you do the, the Microsoft change or the partner change. You should hopefully end up with the same thing. But in this example, we kind of analyze the difference between the RTM version and then the partner version. And that delta, we extract that out into a, an object by itself. And then we move that delta to the other side and apply that to the new version. And the delta here should, of course, read, we, we added uh, the email field. And eventually, we are then able to calculate the resulting version here, which is whatever was there plus added email field, and we will end up with, with this. At least in theory, this is doable, and this is what we would like to, to do. And actually, I spoke about this in the, in the lab section uh, last year. We were working with some techniques and, and trying to see if we get to this. And now, actually, we have uh, this in, in the product. Now, I'm going to demo a little bit of this, and we do have sessions on this as well. But before I do so, we need to have the naming straight, because we have so many you know, text files and, and, and versions in place here. So the first one we, we call the original. And the names I'm using here is also the names being used by the commandlets that, that allows us to, to do all this. So there's the original version. That's, that's kind of easy. And then there's the modified version. Um, and modified version basically means the, the, the partner version, there's been some modification to the original version. And if you think about the, the delta, that's easy. That's the difference between uh, the two versions. And then you have what we call the target version. That is the target to which the delta should be applied. And eventually we will end up with the uh, result version here. So having these names in our mind when we're talking about these things is, is important. So, let us see a little bit about this. So what I did to um, make it a little bit easy here was I made a bitmap of these uh, pictures here. So there it is. So I'll just keep this open, and then I'll open the, um, the commandlet prompt here, uh, which is the um, development shell. 
so in there we have all the, the commandlets being able to, to do these things. A good thing is always to use the help function, go help and then NAV. That will uh, list all the commands that have something NAV-ish in it, which basically means the, the NAV commands here. And you can see there's a, a compile objects, import objects, export objects, compare objects. In here you'll find all the commandlets that you need to do this operation of uh, in an automated fashion, export stuff, import stuff, compare stuff, merge stuff, differentiate stuff, and, and, and so forth. Now, if we look at what we got here, very simple. Um, I have in the RTM version, the original version, I have my uh, tab 888.txt. Uh, text. So, I have a blank file, well, wait a second. Wrong place. So here you'll see it with the with the phone number, uh, first name, and last name. That's kind of the original version in the unchanged format. And let's just look at the 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 added one, the modified version. Um, so if I go modified version and tab in here lies the the modified version where you can see we have phone number, first name, last name, and and this time we have an email. What I can do now is I can run the commandlet to do a compare uh, between these two. Um, so I go compare nav application object. And there are some defaults here where I can put in the first one is the original and the next one is and so forth. But I can also put in the, the parameters which I prefer to do so everybody including myself know what I'm, what I'm doing here. So the original path of this one was um, backslash original backslash tab 888.txt. The uh, modified path was backslash modified. Um, and then where do I want to put the, the delta? So I have a delta path. I want to put that in delta. Um, and then I put a force parameter, meaning if anything is in the delta, just override it. I don't care. So this is a very simple way of doing a, a, a compare operation. As you see here, it, it analyzed the situation and figured out there's one changed object, which is not that surprising. And I can now type the <coughs> delta and see what's, what's in here. It produces a, a delta file. And what you'll see is a file that, that looks very much like the, the normal uh, NAV uh, file. I'll just scrub so you can see it here. You see, the, the format is the same thing, but we are talking now about a, a modification uh, to the file. And here we are talking about an insertion, which, which sits just around here. Uh, and then there's insert after, and there's a changed element, and, and so forth. So the textual file is still readable, but here we have, in essence, the delta. And now can go on now and, and, and apply the delta to the, to the target version and so forth. We will demonstrate that in the session. Uh, we'll also have one that does all of it, take the original and compare, apply, and write the results. So you'll end up with, with, with one version uh, doing the entire thing. I'm just trying to get to some of the, the building pieces uh, here. Now, of course, during the code merge, there's also in the session, by the way, all handling of conflicts and so forth. So, so uh, you will definitely see how to, how to do that. But, but during the code merge and the metadata changes is only half the equation. We also need to take care of automating um, the, the data upgrade. And in there, you, you probably all experience having, for instance, multiple companies inside uh, um, you know, a database, and you have to apply the, the, the upgrade, you have to run the upgrade tool, you have to do this one company at a time. It's, it's hard without the automation. And again, everything now has been automated and, and put into um, to commandlets. So fast and uh, automation is, of course, a must when we, when we uh, uh, move to the cloud. Uh, that's again uh, a given, uh, given the situation that, that, that we are in. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are uh, independent on, on Seaside. Seaside can no longer be the, the master of doing the upgrade because if you're operating something on the cloud, if you have a repeatable solution, if you have something which you need to multiply a hundred times, it'll be extremely tedious to do it. So there needs to be a way to do that using uh, a command list needs to be, uh, you know, you need to be, no need to be there on man, needs to be scriptable and, and, and so forth. So let us um, 
look uh, uh, a little bit on on the premises here. Basically, nothing changed. I mean, the, the, the way you do data upgrade is, is the same thing as always. You figure out what the prerequisites here. Uh, you need to save data that's been overwritten if you, if you do changes to, to field structures and so forth. So you have a, a you know, what are the prerequisites? You have a run where preserved data. You have, you know, the, the what we used to call buffer tables, and then you copy from the buffer tables into the real tables, and, and all these things. No change as such. The only change here, or the biggest change, is we automated the the entire thing. And let's use the example from before. Even though it's a very simple example, I have the table 888. And what I want to do here is I want to, you know, merge first name, last name into a name field. And now we should imagine this is a change I need to apply to my 500 customer installations, each having multiple companies in the databases or, or whatever. So what we need to do first is we need to create a new um, uh, code unit. And the code unit need to have two... Uh, methods in here, and we need to create a copy table of the data uh, where we preserve the first and last name during the upgrade to, to eventually merge it into the name field. What it's going to look like is, is something like this. And the automation here kicks in because you can see we attributed these methods. First of all, we put the entire thing into an upgrade code unit. So what happens now is when we start up the server, the server will go look for all the code units that are attributed with the upgrade. Like we have test code unit today, we introduced a new type called an upgrade code unit. Again, inside there, we attributed the method here called get table sync setup with a, I'm a, a table sync setup method, meaning whenever somebody tries to do something to a table that is, has destructive uh, consequences like deleting the first list and last name fields, it will go search for a method somewhere describing how should I handle this thing. And what we basically do here is we encode, tell it, whenever that happens, please do a copy of the entire table 888, deliberately I use the numbers here, to table 889. Uh, so that's a copy operation. So that means when I deploy this code unit in a FOB file to a customer site, the system, when it de detects the difference in metadata, will automatically go look for this method. And e in here lies the recipe for how to handle this situation. Um, and you need to handle it by, you know, do a copy into 889. Now, at the same time, then we apply a new method here, which is attributed upgrade. That, that then says, when you do the upgrade, here's the code to run. And as you can see in the code here, we're basically enumerating the old uh, uh, table, what used to be known as the buffer table, the 889 table here, looking, looping through all the records. And for each record, we look up the 888 record and then populate the name field with the first name plus space plus last name. The logic here could probably be improved. If there's a blank first name, you'll end up with something starting with a space, but whatever, that's not the case here. So the, the interesting thing here is the aspect of automation. Having this code unit in place allows you to go to the customer side with the FOB file and just shove it in there and run a data upgrade. The platform will then automatically load up this code unit. In here lies the answer for, oh, I'm doing destructive changes. What should happen? You should do a copy into table 889. OK, I'll do that. And then when you run the, the data upgrade, the same code unit will have the, the, the code to be able to actually move uh, things in there. And then the platform will automatically move to the next company and do the entire thing. Um, everything here will be run in, in parallel, so we introduce parallelism so we can update multiple companies at the same time, and the, the improvement is, is phenomenal in, in upgrade times when we run the, and use this, this framework. Everything is resumable. If there should be an error and so forth, we will flag how far we went with which company, with which uh, installation and so forth, and we are able to, to pick up from where we, where we went. We're a little bit short of time, so I'm not going to show this to you, but basically you have the, the building blocks here. It's all about attributing a code unit with being an upgrade code unit, flagging this method being the table sync setup method and the upgrade method. And from there on, it should be more or less self-explanatory. Over to Michael. Okay, thanks. 
Is this cool or not? <laughs> it is cool. <laughs> okay, on uh, simplification. Uh, so, uh, back from the early days of NAV, uh, one of the mottos of the prog was the beauty of simplicity. <laughs> But what we found out uh, three years ago was that it wasn't as simple as it used to be, because <laughs> just as tree grows, the uh, sort of the ribbon of NV uh, for every release, each team had the fingerprint on the ribbon and put on new stuff, and it just uh, exploded, and also putting uh, new fast tabs and new fields on for every new release, and everything had to be visible. <laughs> uh, so we've been through a number of simplifications that went through 2013, our two, and now 2015, and that's an ongoing effort. But for, for this release, we made a number of changes that's uh, also been a wish for a lot of people for many years. So one of them is mandatory fields, which is not really mandatory, but I'll be, get to, back to that. Uh, it's the order field of the number field uh, to have total some documents that, and you don't have to go into uh, other pages to see that getting rid of all the stuff that you don't need and uh, also the new enhanced queues that we put in and overall the, uh, the new uh, mini app or simplified UX that we're providing uh, also for the tablets. But instead of uh, going through a lot of slides, let's go into the, the product and see this for real. Good, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go into the uh, management console for once. Uh, and here, in, in here, we put in uh, the UI elements removal. Uh, and you can basically, there's three choices. So you can do nothing. You can adhere to the, uh, what you're allowed to do based on the license file, or you can also use a look at the user permission. Uh, and just a warning, in RTM, there's, there's a performance bug that if you use the uh, both the license file and the permission, uh, then things are getting really slow, but in the CU1 that's released, uh, this is fixed uh, and it runs optimal. Uh, but this enables you to control uh, how much the user can see. Uh, so if, if you're not running jobs or CM or whatever, uh, you will not see it uh, in the ribbon or uh, having the fields in there. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing we introduced is this uh, small business uh, role center. And basically, it came out that, uh, of that we also had a product in Denmark called C5, and uh, we wanted to update it to uh, run on the NAV code base. Uh, and C5 is for really small customers, uh, single users, and uh, these are craftsmen often who sit in the van doing it. Uh, so we created this role center for the RTC in the web, but also a special one for the tablet. So, uh, because if you're on minivan and you have your iPad in there, you want to use that to run your business. Uh, and actually, if you visit uh, Pierre Monson, who is here as well, he, uh, he actually runs his business on his phone uh, using the, uh, the, the small business uh, role center. Uh, but as you can see here, compared to the old days, uh, the, uh, the ribbon has really been cleaned up up here. Uh, we dragged all the uh, things necessary for a small business owner to, uh, to run his business in here. So we have the key performance indicators and we have the trial banners on here. Am I bankrupt or not? That's sort of the question you, <laughs> you get answered in here. <laughs> also, uh, instead of having these queues where it's sort of uh, is 168,000, is that good or bad? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but let's uh, go and, and look at the setup to figure it out. So, so basically, for, for all the queues, you get the uh, possibility to go in and uh, define a, a low range or a threshold, uh, one and two, and What's beneath here, you have different sentiments. Uh, you can have none and you can say this is uh, good or this is bad or I don't know or uh, subordinate, so that's just gray or I don't give a shit, <laughs> uh, whatever you like. So, but, but this basically gives you just a hint of is this good or bad or uh, do I have to care at all and uh, do I have to push this bottom to get down here. Um, but let's get a, a bit deeper in here. So, uh, if I go into the sales invoice, you can see there's the uh, the star in here, uh, and the star indicates this is a mandatory field. So, uh, so we also considered that you always had to fill in these fields. But what if if you uh, hide these or you don't uh, have permissions to to see this, then you're sort of stuck 
So we started to have a middle ground where you just get the ASTX that you need to fill this out, but we let you go if uh, you don't do it. Um, so let's get and go and sell something to Sportsmeyer. <laughs> uh, and you can also see that the, uh, the, the number was not filled up from the start, and now it's up there. So, uh, so the, uh, if you have a number series and only one, and you cannot do uh, manual numbers in there, uh, we, we basically decide for you that you don't have to see the, uh, uh, the invoice number in here. Uh, so we remove it because it's sort of redundant. Uh, to, to see that. Uh, also, if we expand the lines, you can see we put the tools in here because, of course, you want to see the tools. Um, and this, this was also back from the uh, beauty of simplicity days that this was actually in in the beginning, from, but in one or other reason, uh, version it got lost over time, but now we put it back. Um, let's go in. Let's buy some, f sell some front wheels. So. <laughs> And the two. <laughs> yes, and now we can see the uh, sums are updated down here. Uh, so again, simple, 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 and uh, we are continuing the effort to uh, to remove more and then newer versions, uh, and really emphasize what's important for the end user to uh, to work on. So very short about simplification. Now back to something really complex and nasty, Thomas. <laughs> I'm not complex and nasty. Oh, but the topic is... <laughs> ah. All right, the, the next thing we are, we are going to talk a bit about is, is Office 365 integration. And again, this is going to be more about how you do stuff and, and uh, some of the building blocks available to, to achieve what, what you want to do with, the, with this integration. At this time, there should be no doubt that Microsoft is heavily you know, betting on Office 365. It's our fastest growing uh, business uh, within Microsoft and definitely uh, as, as NAV being the division we are, you know, we want to be on that wagon as well. So we are going to continue our investment into uh, the, the cloud, into Office 365 and, and, and so forth. Now, the interesting thing here is there, there are a couple of scenarios we have right now in, in NAV. Um, the first one is, of course, this open in Excel that sits uh, at the far right here in the ribbon. And when you run that one, strange things happen. Sometimes you get an error. That's, that's happened often to me. Sometimes it opens in your on-prem Excel. But what happens if you have an online web client sitting there and you want to be able to open it in the online Excel? Now what? How do you set that up? How, how does that work? And what happens uh, behind the scenes? So basically, what is this? How does it work? And, and you know, what is required to, to make it work? So if we're talking about these scenarios, there are two things I, I, I want to cover today. The first one is, you know, get the Send to Excel to work from an online web client to the online version of Excel. What is required to, to make that work? And the list is here. It's actually quite simple. The first thing you need to do is you need to have an Office 365 subscription to make this work. The reason for that is that basically it's, it's very simple. Whenever you do this export to Excel, what we do behind the scene is we actually save the whatever list you're having to a file, and we need a place to save that file. Uh, and right now, the only thing that, that we support is saving it on a SkyDrive uh, Pro or SkyDrive for Business or essentially a SharePoint site. Um, and whenever we save it there, then we can open up the online Excel and have online Excel pick it up from, from that location. That is essentially what, what, what goes on. And this is what is needed to, to make that happen. I'll, I'll demo that in a second. The other one that's, that's really promising is the entire story about single sign-on to your, to your Office account. So you link your, your ID on, in the cloud to your nav user ID and have them being the same thing. There's a tremendous amount of advantages by doing that, uh, but it seems to be something that, that's complex to set up, complex enough for us to actually have done a command lib that does everything. Uh, and and of, course, of course, you can use that one, but what I'm gonna show you today is actually the bits and pieces involved in, in doing it if you wanna do it manually. 
So again, this is all about having an Azure subscription, and this one is actually for free. It's interesting because inside the Azure cloud lives something called the AAD, the Azure Active Directory. It's basically an, a, a cloud-hosted super Huber domain controller where you get your own node. And this service of using that one as part of the Azure services is for free. So you can, you can go and create an, an, an Azure subscription. You need, uh, as usual, on, on those things to, to give your, your payment info, but it's for free. Nothing will, will happen as long as you're just using uh, AAD. And then you need to configure the client, not to ask for, for nav username password, and you need to configure the, the server. So let's go uh, look at this. So the first thing was the, um, the uh, Active Directory thing. So I've set up something here. I have a remote into a machine. This is a uh, machine in the cloud. I created a nav TD a 2014 domain, uh, which, which is you know, just a, a free uh, Office 365 uh, subscription. And, and at this point, I'm, I'm ready to, to go try these things. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use the, the web client, opening up my First, I'm going to sign in just to show you this. I'm going to sign into Office 365 using my, my credentials here. So my credentials on my trial Office 365 account was Thomas at nav TD2014 on my... It's hard to spell to Microsoft. Com. Like this. Okay, so this is... Simple enough, now I signed in, here is my Office 365, as you can see it's a, it's a trial version, and that gives me the SharePoint site, so now I have my location to be able to set up where the web client, the online hosted web client, should be able to save um, uh, my Excel when I do with the, the export Excel itself. So I'm just showing you, you, you the, the sign-in process here. Closing the browser, make sure we forget everything. Open it again, I'll do the... Um, this time the NAV. And as you'll see, the, I'll be asked for my nav user password here. Um, that's a standard uh, installation here. The, I haven't created anything, anything special except this, this user account. So this entire thing is running on, on uh, an Azure machine in the cloud. If I go to, to any list, take the customer list, um, and then, of course, I have the, the open in Excel. Now, if I click, click this one, I get this error, which is, you know, a little bit strange. It, it has to do with my browser setting does not allow me to, to download files or, or something. But you might expect other errors, like you do not have Excel installed locally, so how should I open this XLS file or, or, or whatever. What I really wanted to do was to have the online version of uh, Excel open up the file. And to do that, I need a, a few things. I need to go into the online um, document storage um, uh, configuration. And again, this search feature is also present in the web client. Uh, you've probably all grown used to it in the RTC client today. It's, it's super. It's also in the web client, and, and you can quickly navigate to, to pages. Anyway, I go in here, and I need to create a service, uh, basically a, a, a way or a, a you, you, what I'm doing here is basically telling the system where should you store stuff when you uh, try to, to export in the cloud. I can give it an ID, I can give it a description. It really doesn't matter. What's important is, is out here. Where's the location this should be stored? And that just sit on my domain. Um, HTTP, and then I need to type in my, my uh, domain name, and that was the uh, nav. CD2014.sharepoint.com. One could imagine in the future that we are going to support things like, you know, uh, uh, OneDrive and, and, and so forth. But currently, we only support the SharePoint for, for this. Then I need to designate a, a folder. And that's essentially just you do a folder here, and whatever is getting transferred using this send to Excel mechanism ends up in this folder, not to destroy your, your other things on your SharePoint site. So I can call it what, whatever. It'll be auto created if it's not there. And I need to 
tell it within which document repository on the SharePoint site this sits. You know, when you open a SharePoint site, you also have these documents and you have some team stuff and so forth. But the most easy thing is just to do the documents. Uh, then you're in the document folder. And then what I need to fill in here is the user credential that have access to the SharePoint site that the, the web client can actually use to, to store the, the document. And that's my, my account from the sign in before. So I'm going to do with it uh, Thomas at nav td 2014.on microsoft.com. And then I need to set the password for this account, and I do that in here. And I put my password here. And it asked me whether I want to change my password. Not really, but, well, strange. Anyway, and then there's a test connection or test button, so I can click this one just to make sure that everything works. And if I'm lucky, it'll tell me it works. The connection validated correctly, so everything works here, and then I can close it up. And then I have my customer list, and when I press the open in Excel, now it will end up saving the, 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 the auto-generated file on a SharePoint site. It will open up the online Excel and, and get it in here. Now, what you see here is this is one of the reasons for this single sign-on being interesting, right? Now I'm asked when I jump to the online Excel to type in my credentials. Of course, I could put the, the keep me signed in here, but I'm not doing that to, to demonstrate to you how the single sign-on is nice when you have it. I don't have it right now. Anyway, I sign in here, Thomas at TD2014. Ah, come on, this is too soon. Um, dot com. Right. There we go. And ta -da, I end up in the online Excel, hopefully with the list. So it is not that hard to set up. You just need to know exactly what, what to do. Well, that was part one. Um, the other part is actually, you know, starting to, to look at the the single sign-on. If I go back to the slide again for, for a second and, and just you know, to, to show you what, what was needed here. Uh, again, an Azure subscription with, with having the right site now. I do have that one created already. And then I need to go into the managed portal of Azure and telling Azure about NAV because this Active Directory that sits in the Azure cloud needs to know about NAV being an application. And I'll get back to, to, to that in a second. Um, and then I need to create a, a, a user on the NAV side that accepts the credentials coming from Office 365. And eventually I need to change the way the client and the server authenticate so we're not using the, the NAV username password anymore. These are the five things I need to do. And again, it's all about knowing this. Um, and of course, this has been written down numerous times, but I'm going to show you how, how easy this essentially is to do. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to open up a browser and I go into the Azure management portal. Again, I'm asked to, to sign in here. I'm getting a little bit tired of typing all this. Uh, Thomas. Uh, uh, is that also part of getting old, Thomas? Yes. <laughs> right. So this brings me to my Azure subscription. And this is, a, a, again, a, a free trial account I, I've set up here um, on Azure. I have the capabilities to create virtual machines and all that kind, but that costs money. What I'm interested in is actually the free thing here, and that is the usage of the Active Directory. It sits at the bottom here, so I can scroll all the way down here. Uh, and you'll see there's an Active Directory. That's the only thing this, this account has. All the other things are at zero, the zero VM, zero connection, zero, whatever. But there's an Active Directory which is needed. So what I do in here, I go into the Active Directory, and then I can look about the, I can, con can configure it here. I can see users, groups, applications, and there's applications I'm, I'm interested in. Here are the applications that I want 
to give the permission to use this Active Directory, and Active Directory should know about the applications I create in here. Basically, these applications should participate in the uh, single sign-on process. So I need to create a new application. I'll do that here. What is the kind of application? Is it one for the gallery, or is it one I'm developing myself? I'll go full manual here, so I'll do the, the one I'm developing myself. Okay, what's the name of it? Well, we can use the name to have TD2014, keep the, uh, the naming here. Okay. And then here comes, the, what is the sign on uh, URL? And, and the reason for that, I'll get back to that in a second, is that the Azure Active Directory needs to know how to redirect requests back and forth when you type things into your browser. You probably already experience is you go into something it needs your live ID or your office ID or whatever and you kind of go this click 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 browser goes back and forth and you kind of what is it doing and I'll get back to that in a second but basically what we're doing here is we are telling it if you need to navigate to this application this would be the the uh, URL you need to put in to navigate to the application and the easiest place to get that is actually just to go to the NAV client um, the NAV web client and just steal the, the, uh, the URL here because this is the, the, uh, the sign on uh, URL you're, you're going to use. We can strip some of the, the uh, detailed part here uh, and just go with the, with the web client. That is enough. Um, so I'll copy this one, go back to my Active Directory and say this was my sign in URL. The next one I'm going to put in is an app ID. Um, and it is just basically an identifier being used several places, um, but it needs to be in URL format. I really don't know why, but well, it requires it to be, so I'll put it in here, uh, HTTP, and there will be an app, uh, TD2014. I just decide to, to use that as my URL. It's not really an URL you're navigating to, it's more like an identifier of the, the application. That's it. That is what I need to set up. And now I told the Active Directory about NAV being an application uh, in the cloud. I can go and look at this if I, if I so want to. Uh, there's a dashboard, I can see what goes on. I can go into the configure and, and add additional details. And I can just show you something in here that might be a little bit interesting. Here you'll find the sign on URL, the name, the things I entered before. Um, but you have one thing here, uh, which is the reply URL. And this is part of the security of the Active Directory, meaning whenever Active Directory send keys and tokens and whatever back to somebody requesting info for this application, it will never ever send anything to something which is not either this specific URL or a subdomain of, of that URL. So to make things secure here, instead of having it all the way to the web client, you can basically go and say, I'm just gonna be happy with anything being sent to my domain. So if I change this, that means that Azure Directory will, will send whatever, as long as the, the URL kind of starts with, with the info we have here. Another thing worth noticing is the permissions down here where you can decide uh, which permissions have access uh, or which, which uh, applications have access to what. So when a user comes in, this user have access to do this and this and that and, and, and so forth. By default, it's set up in a manner where it's usable, meaning that there's a delegation. So whenever you come in, that particular user can read. I, re I delegate to that user to be able to read the, the, uh, the Azure Active Directory itself. And there's a sign-in permission. Okay, that's enough. I'll save this one. And, and that's it. Now I told the Azure Active Directory about NAV as an application. Next thing I need to do is I need to go into the NAV and create a, a, a user here. So I'll do that. Um, log in. Go create a new user. And do a new one. We call it uh, TH. Error, full name, Thomas H. No expiry date. And then leave everything as is in here except the authentication email. This user authenticates by using the Office 365 authentication. So I need to put in the email here. 
Again, that's Thomas, LTD 2014.1. Um, and then I get the activation status is inactive, meaning this user hasn't logged on yet, so we don't know uh, about him yet. But I'm creating the user here, and I just need to assign some permissions, and I'll do the, the super to myself here. That's essentially it. At this point, I created this user. I'll close it, and now I'm ready to... I closed it, I didn't save it. That was not on purpose. Um, it is saved, okay. Um, uh, oh, there it is, okay. So now I need to reconfigure this, the, the server and the client to use the new authentication method instead of using the, the nav username password. And while doing that, I lock out my nav user user, which is why I need to create the new user first, otherwise I'm kind of toast. I need to, to reconfigure back again. I'll close this one. And what I did is I prepared two shortcuts here which will navigate to the location of the server and client configuration files. See on timing, I need to hurry up a little bit here, so I'll do it a little bit fast. But what I need to do is I need to go into the configuration file here. The normal one you see has a lot of text into it. I removed that and isolated what we're gonna look at here. These two keys are everything that we need to change. Today, they identify that you're, you're using nav username password, and um, there's another key that's blank because it's not relevant for nav username password. What I need to put in instead is I wanna use the access control service, and then I need to put the location of the federation service, basically meaning where do you go for tickets, IDs, and privileges, and, and, and so forth. And this is the entire path that I get, which points up to uh, my Azure um, um, uh, Active Directory. You'll see in the, in the help file, you actually have everything sitting here, log in Windows Net, and then add your own tenant ID here. And that's the only thing I did. I put in nav td2014 microsoft.com, and that's it. So I'll just replace these two lines with the other lines. I'll zap these two and put them into the comment, and I'll take the other two, take out of the comment, and, and put here. And that's it. I'll save this one, and I'll do the same thing for the client configuration, uh, the web config file, and essentially we have the same thing here. Down here we have, again, two keys that needs to be changed. Again, it's credential type, same thing as before. We need to have, you know, tell it to use the Azure Active Directory. And then where do you go? The Active Directory UIA. Where do you go to get the entire sign-on going and so forth? I'll do these two keys, zap them, put them here, take the other two keys, zap them and put them to be used. And I'll save this one. The last thing I need to do is to restart the server to be able to do the new, of course, all this can be done through commandlets, but old habits die hard, right? So I'm gonna restart the server. And after having done that, I should be good to go with the single sign-on experience using my uh, TH account. There we go. So I'll open this one and I'll go to the send as before. If everything works now, we <coughs> should not see the nav user uh, sign-on dialog. Instead, we should see an Office 365 and that's exactly what, what came up here. And I go, okay, I use this account. Um, I need to type my password. Um, and now I can use the keep me signed in and all the things that we are, we are used to have and so forth. And now exactly I get absolutely nothing. Okay, I mistyped something along the way, I'm sorry. Um, but that's the, the you know, live demos and so forth. Normally when you get in here, everything is then set up and you will have the, the sign-on experience working on um, NAV and the office components and you can all do, do these, you know, export, import and you'll, you'll keep using your same uh, credentials there. When you do sign off of NAV, you will also sign off of, of all the, uh, the other services because this, the sign off process is, is common to all the, the, the products here. So going back to this, um, 
one last thing uh, to talk about here is how this how this works essentially, and what we have here is um, it's all about exchanging tokens and trusting tokens. So essentially, we decide to trust the Active Directory. It could have been Live ID, could have been other forms of, of, of IDs, and we do that by putting that into the configuration file of the server. We trust this guy up here. Okay, that that's fine. And then they send us a token. When you do the login of, uh, in, the, in the cloud, we end up getting a token from, from that service. And we can see inside the token your, your uh, mail address is there and so forth. And we can match that to a, to a NAV user. At the same time, certificates make sure that it isn't tampered with. And we can check both the, the authentication and, and, and so forth on these, uh, on these tokens. Um, what really goes on, let me just click through this, is this is what goes on when you try to, to, to do a lock-in. There's a lot of pinging, panging back and forth between the, um, the, the web browser and the Active Directory or another identity provider. And eventually you have, you know, you get your first page. This is what's happening when you see things where you kind of go click, 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 and the, the browser keeps uh, reloading. And if you do this keep me signed in, you kind of skip these two steps where the UI is presented, uh, meaning the entire thing will go on every time you do uh, a navigation to one of these pages, but you'll skip these steps showing the, the UI. All right. Thank you. So this looked fairly easy if you just able to... Type in your password. Type, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, uh, so we have two topics left, so let's move very fast through the roadmap because I want Thomas to show some of the new stuff uh, and get your reaction to that. So, uh, you all know uh, NIV started back in 87 with uh, version 1 of the text based version. Uh, and then 2000, of course, we had this Franken uh, platform where we had the classic and the new stuff in the same. Uh, in the same uh, same platform, uh, 2009 R2, we, we added uh, CM integration and some visualizations. But the real big things happened in 2013, where basically most of the server was uh, rewritten, and uh, also we made a lot of extensions to the client uh, to extend it from just having a web client to also uh, support uh, other clients. And that's basically the foundation that we're building on. Uh, and you'll see that we are, we are now able to move much faster than the old world, where it took three years to create something because we had to deal with all the uh, old nasty C++ plus code. And now we have a modern three-tier platform uh, that also runs on Azure. Um, uh, of course, in, in R2, we uh, created multi-tenancy. And uh, also, we went very much into the cloud uh, and, and enabled that also based on what we did before uh, and building on the uh, uh, investment that we did. And, uh, and also we are moving into uh, very much the, the tooling side of running a large scale operation of NAV uh, and not just uh, doing it side C side. Um, of course, the last but not least, the, in 2015 you all saw uh, these, but also a lot of great app features on CAFS management and uh, simulation that we put in. Uh, to enable that. But moving forward to, uh, uh, to the future, uh, so previously we, uh, we had a slide that uh, where everything ended in, I think, 2015, and people said, oh, they don't want to discontinue the product, so, uh, but we are not. We're going to continue after that. So we made a new slide that now we continue, so that should solve that part of it. Uh, but just as the previous release, we have uh, a code name that's a Greek island called Corfu, uh, nice island, uh, and we probably are running out of the. I think we're running islands. out of islands. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, but since we are very much running agile now, everything is is not planned to every detail when we start the release. This is pretty much work in progress. Uh, so right now we have this one-year release cadence, but you should expect to see shorter release cadence in the future as well. Uh, because if you look at Windows, Windows 10 is the last version that we know Windows 11. It's just going to be Windows 10 going on. And uh, nobody cares about Office 65, what that what version that is. It's just Office 65. So, 
So maybe something in that line would happen to NAV as well. Uh, but right now, some of the themes that we're working for is working on this workflow. Uh, that's been a long-standing wish to have some foundation work in there. Also on the document management and, uh, and uh, OCR. Um, also on the uh, on having a better connection to uh, uh, electronic trades and uh, and handling the the mapping between documents out there. That's another uh, wish that we had for a long time. And beyond that, we are going to continue work on the client. So Thomas talked about the new tablet client and how that improved the uh, the single page concept. And also, what also wrapped off on the web clients, we're going to continue this world and uh, work and uh, and try to get a single code base across all the the uh, web webis clients, including tablets for uh, for the clients, to make sure that they have a single code base in there, and we can flourish on all the uh, um, all the progress across all of these clients. Especially, uh, you know, the web client was sort of the uh, the theme back when we do that. This was for large users, so it's not really a replacement for the RTC or companion for the RTC. We're going to fix that, so uh, we'll have a web client that's as good or better than the RTC uh, in the next release. Uh, but don't expect us to come out with a full-fledged workflow or document management solution. This, these are foundations, and uh, we're also looking for partnership with uh, con solutions out there to make a good solution. Uh, but this is basically putting in the uh, railroad tracks and the architecture to, to build on it for the future. <laughs> Very fast on the roadmap, because we need to go to the lab. <laughs> yes, this is, this is the, the favorite part of, 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 of this show. This is where we kind of get to do the free form. Let's just discuss what, what, what we, are, we are thinking about. Notice the front page here, Microsoft Dynamics and then nobody knows because what we have here is really what Michael and I are, are thinking about when, when nobody is watching, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when we have our, our discussions of where, where do we want to take this product from a technical angle, what can we see of perspectives and so forth, mm -hmm. and, and we have lots of things. There will be no Mythbusters this year. Unfortunately, we do not have time. We will come up with other things like a Jeopardy show next year, I think, where we'll have categories like how come Michael's still here? And you know, <laughs> how come, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do. How come Michael's still here for three hundred? That's so why, for sure. You know. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, why? yes absolutely. <laughs> There's also we don't need no stinking architects, but that category is kind of well. Anyways, especially the stinking part. <laughs> so, again, disclaimer: everything you see here is just ideas. There's no promises of this showing up in the product next month, or even five years from now, or even at all but we are gonna share some, some of the ideas here. The first thing we really would like to do something about is, as, as said before in the, the merch section, we would like to introduce some kind of event-driven customizations. I would say this is probably the one that has the highly, highest likelihood of making it in, in some time soon. Um, and, and the idea here is basically that you are being able to hook any method without the method itself knows that it's being hooked. And that's a big difference because that means that you, from a subscriber standpoint, tell the system, I want to hook onto this method, and here's what I need. I need these two parameters, this local variable, this global variable, and you need to call me before the method, and I'll take it from here. That allows us the freedom from the, the guy being hooked. He can actually change the parameters, add additional parameters, add additional local variables, and so forth. As long as the thing I subscribe to is still there, then this one will, won't break, and you can keep having this uh, subscription hook being there. It will be able to daisy chain them. You can call base and have the original functionality being executed. You can fiddle with the return value before it returns and, and, and so forth. All these things is something that we kind of see as being part of an event-driven customization. And then, of course, if we do something new, we're going to take care of versioning, dependency tracking, and all these things to make absolutely sure we, we generate something which, which lasts uh, way into to the future. Again, the purpose of all this is, again, to make a more seamless you know, upgrade and, and, and that entire experience there. Now, the, 
The big difference about such a customization would, of course, still be AL, still be something you install on the server, you still need to compile stuff and, and so forth. But there are other scenarios where you would like to, to be able to do other kinds of customization. I'll get back to that in a, in a second. Another one interesting is subscriptions. One of the services that lies in, in the Azure cloud is something called Azure uh, subscriptions or the, the, uh, the service bus. Essentially, if you think about it, the service bus is just an advanced queuing mechanism, meaning you can subscribe to tell me whenever there are red balls put into this queue, whatever. And then you can go to sleep. And somebody else can put the red balls into the queue and when you wake up and the day after and reboot your machine and so forth, you can ask for all the red balls that was put into the queue. It's a queuing mechanism uh, in its essence. There's a lot of you know, uh, niceness to this and, and details, but it's a, in essence, it's a queuing mechanism. Now imagine a world where you could tell NAV to put red balls on the queue whenever a sales order was posted with a... With a uh, you know, amount greater than this or that, or whenever a customer was created and so forth. You could generate all kinds of interesting synchronization or cooperation scenarios between the cloud, even if you were offline. And this is the, the, the great part about this. The Azure service bus is always online. So you can count of that being there, so you can always deliver your red balls, but then the consumers can be offline and come online and pick them up at, at any time. And of course, the reverse is also interesting, uh, where you have a situation where you, from ale, want to subscribe to somebody putting blue balls in another queue. Whenever that happens, I want to know, because then I need to print an invoice or whatever. It could be a production system running all night. Whenever something happens, leave a trace in, in the uh, Azure service bus and then have your application pick up those traces uh, when you come online and, and, and so forth. That's one idea. I think it's really cool. What do you think? Oh, okay. We haven't made it yet. We're just thinking about it, you know. So, we, we need to make more of these things. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> now, another thing is, is, as I talked a little bit about before, about these having the applications being something written in AL and you need to, to recompile and so forth. Um, again, if you're running something multi-tenant where you have, you know, one server serves uh, hundreds or, or maybe even thousands of, of, of customers, and then you want to do something for a single tenant, or you want to do uh, some, some special things here, the problem is going to your host or going to your own machine saying this tenant here wants this special customization and by the way install these eight DLLs and stuff like that. You would never risk that. I mean that's simply too dangerous. If you're getting things hosted in, out in, 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 in city as part of a, a big multi-tenant uh, system in the cloud, you probably cannot provide your host or two to go and put in uh, special things for you because he's sharing the entire thing across uh, multiple instances, uh, thousands or hundreds of, of, of customers. So what we're looking at here is something where you have the capability of installing add-ons, which, uh, which are non-intrusive. So and that is the, the, the most important thing here. So I put in something, here we call it an MXD, but it could be called whatever, don't take the naming here. But I put in some extra piece of metadata. The system will let it run time, read the standard application definition of a given page, but then figure out that there's an extra thing here. So it's not intrusive, it doesn't destroy what was there, it just add an extra control to that page. Let's say a link button to do your sign-in on Office 365 or, or, or something silly. So whenever you, the user of that particular tenant or, or, or whatever takes out his page, that button will be present, but for other users it will not. It doesn't ruin the, the application, it can be removed again. At any point, you can just simply remove this add-on thing and the entire thing will be uh, you know, away and you're back to the original. You do not change the application on the server. There's no recompilation, retesting, recertification, nothing of all that because you do not change the application. That is the most important thing about this idea. It's non-intrusive and nothing has changed. Um, you can, of course, build on that and say, what about the, the even more intrusive one, which is still in a non-intrusive fashion? I want to add a field. But I, I really want to add a field without ruining the, the normal application. So this is a situation where 
uh, this particular customer wants to have a single field added to his, his customer record. We do not touch the customer record itself. We just tell the system whenever you, you read customer records before you send them to the client to be shown. Go and then see if you have a foreign key uh, to this bulk database where extra fields are stored and then merge everything seamlessly into the data sets and into the UI on the client. So all the clients will work and, and nobody will know that this field has been, has been added. The good thing is, however, if you don't like it, you can just remove that feature again because you haven't changed the original application. Everything here is, is unchanged. Um, Another thing you could you could see well I have a, another thing is, is on the MXD you can see here is that we we would really like to you know have dependency tracking have this this one being showed as uh, something that is only shown for a given role or a given tenant or a given logical condition it really doesn't matter since it's something you can add and remove at any point you can also have it come and go on, on even and odd minutes if you so choose a silly thing but but that's something you, you definitely could be able to do. <clears throat> Non-intrusive code, now it gets even more interesting. Um, if we cannot change the application on the server, which we can't, because then the hoster or the, the other customers would be angry if we crash something, what about, what about having extra code being, being run? Let's say I want to do an automated currency lookup thing. Why can't that happen at the client? Why can't I have a button sitting on the client, and when I press that button, it will go to an external service, look up the currency code, come back and fill in my field in my screen for that. That's a pure client thing, if, if such a feature. You could have other features, zip code lookup or whatever. There's, there's tons of, of, of these scenarios. And basically, we're starting here to think about something which we, when we think about it, is this, an, is this nav apps? Is this kind of an app model where you download something as a user even? You install it, poof, it works. It enhances your experience in the UI by being able to run JavaScript on the UI, and that JavaScript can do anything the user can do. It's not like you get any special privileges and go mess with the application. No, but you get an automated fashion of doing things with the UI um, on screen, which is kind of interesting. There's, there's definitely ideas here. So you could call external services or you could call into APIs on the server. And these APIs are public. That could be web services. That could be whatever. It's not like, as I'm saying, you're not ruining with the application. Nobody you know, is, is getting special privileges. Now, that's it. That's some of the ideas that we have been you know, thinking about, some of the things that, that might show up in the product. We are 39 seconds from uh, being at the next break. I think both Michael and I would really like to thank, especially Luke, for giving us the opportunity of, of being here to talk about the product that we, we all love. It's fabulous to see so many people here. I don't know what Nick, Nick is going to do when we break the record next year with even more people because it seems to be pretty full in here, but probably he will have an idea. Yeah. Thank you very much for attending and have a really good show. Thank you. Thank you.